times. How did the bad angels get into heaven? Yeah, in the first place, because uh, you can't get to heaven if you're bad. Oh, right, okay, right. Um, <coughs> that's not true. Well, oh, you can't get to heaven if you're bad, if I... Yeah, oh. <coughs> right, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll take a look at this, because there is a lot of misunderstanding about heaven in relation to angels and the demons, all right? So the question is, because at various places in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we read of, of the demons and Satan being in heaven. And the question is, how can they be in heaven when they're bad? Now, first of all, and I won't go into this into great details about the first point, but obviously the angels were created by God, all right? They were created, the angel realm were created before anything material happened. If you uh, just turn with me to Job 38, We'll just establish this. <coughs> if you find Job 38 and find verse 4, <coughs> and this is God speaking to Job, and Job here has been overstepping himself a little bit with God. He's largely right. In the book of Job, most of what Job says is in actual fact right. And it's what his three friends say to him that's wrong. But the point is, Job starts to feel sorry for himself, and he oversteps himself. And so therefore, in order to put him in his place, God asks him a series of questions. Like, come on, Job, if you're so great, answer me this, all right? And one of the questions that God asks is this. In verse 4, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? All right? And here, God is quite simply saying, now, careful, Job, remember, you are a, cre a creature, and I am your creator. Tread a little bit more carefully. So God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And, of course, when God says that to you, it's rhetorical. There's no answer. You realise you shrink back down to the size that you are, sort of, when you compare yourself with God. But then in verse 7, God says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, if you trace it in the Bible, in the Old Testament, so the sons of God and morning stars refer to the angels, all right? Now, the important thing to see here is that when God zaps the whole universe into existence, which took him six times 24 hours, and there are no compromises on that because that's what the Bible says, when God did that, the angels were there having a party, rejoicing. However, by the end of the week, Satan appears in the guise of being a fallen angel. So therefore, from this, we can know that the angels, headed up by Satan himself, fell from grace in the sense that they sinned against God. Satan got proud. He wasn't satisfied with, um, you know, being... A creature. He wanted to be God himself. He didn't want to play second fiddle. So he fell, and we'll see as we proceed through this tonight, that in fact a third of the angels decided that they'd go with Satan and go against God. They thought they'd been with a chance, a third of them. We'll see that a bit later on. So basically, the situation by the time God created us lot and the earth and the universe, the angels have been existing before that, God created them, zap, pow, all right, uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing, fiat creation, as it's called, a fiat is a command, all right, and God zaps them into being, just like he did with the universe and that, and then they fell, all right, some fell, some remain faithful to God. Now, in regards to heaven, heaven is the dwelling place of God. Throughout the Bible, God, sorry, heaven is where God the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, where the Trinity live. Now, it's important to understand this. When God created, he sort of put this universe there. It's important for you to understand that he zapped the universe into existence. Now, this tells us precisely this. Because God put it there, all right, it wasn't there before, and then God put it there. Now, that tells us something very important, that the universe is finite. It's finite. Now, over the last 100, 150 years, well, I suppose throughout history, but with the rise of so-called modern science, it's been speculated that the universe just goes on forever and forever and forever, and, you know, it's infinite, all right? Now, it's important to grasp that the Bible says that it's finite. It has boundaries, it has borders. It's a created thing that is there. Now, the interesting thing 
therefore, is that heaven is outside of our universe. Okay, it's outside. Now, modern science came up with the idea that the universe is infinite. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, if that was true, then heaven can't be outside of it. Because if the universe goes on forever, that's all there is. There can't be anything outside of it. But the Bible says that heaven is outside of the universe. Now then, on the scene comes a certain man called Einstein. And 20th century physics has progressed a bit now. And it's fascinating where it's come to. All right. And what it is thought today, it's a theory, it can't be proven in the sense that no one can actually do it. But, as, you know, it's accepted. All the evidence points in its favour. Evolution isn't on this same thing, because evolution, the evidence goes against it. But with Einstein's theory, all the evidence is for it. And it's basically this, that for someone who is inside of that universe, if you set out in a straight line, you will go on forever and forever and forever and forever. But then eventually what will happen is that you'll come back to the point that you started. But you'll just keep going on forever and forever. So for anyone inside, the universe has no end. But the point is, for someone who's outside of it, it would appear as a fixed globe or something like that. So relative to someone inside the universe, it is indeed infinite. But relative to someone outside of it, it's finite. So in actual fact today, our cosmology, which is the word for the theory of the nature of the universe, is that it is finite. To those inside of it, you can never get out of it. Because all you can do is go round and round inside it. You think you're going in a straight line, but in fact you're curving. An array of light, which will always travel in a straight line in a vacuum, which space is, it will always travel in a straight line. And yet it's observed that light curves. Sometimes a ray of light can be curved, it can bend. And it's bent by a gravitational force near it. And what was discovered, in fact, this is so fascinating, is that space itself is stuff, and it can bend. So therefore, in the universe, a traveller travelling at the speed of light who goes out at bang in a straight line, he will always be travelling in a straight line, and all his instruments will tell him he's going in a straight line. But in fact, he's moving in a straight line in space, which is curving and bringing him back where he started from. All right? Now, this is where 20th century science has got us. And the point is that 4,000 years ago, the Bible started to tell us that the universe is finite. All right? So, again, modern science has got to where the Bible was thousands of years ago. And after all, God should know, because he put the universe there. Therefore, when we read the Bible, we've got the specifications of the maker. So, the important thing to realise is that the universe is there, and heaven is outside of it, all right? Because heaven is the dwelling place of God. Now, as we go through in the Old Testament, we find um, instances. Uh, for instance, if you turn back to the beginning of the book of Job, all right? And if you find chapter 1. <clears throat> now, we've already established that the sons of God in the Old Testament, when you get the phrase sons of God, it means angels. Let me just explain to you, take a slight detour here, all right, around the theological universe, all right, slight detour. Why it is that angels in the Old Testament are referred to as sons of God? Because there's a very special reason. And there are certain persons and groups of persons who in the scriptures are called the sons of God. And it's important for us to understand what a son of God in this sense is. In the Bible, a son of God is any being or group of beings who have been created by God, Zap Pow that they are alive because God has supernaturally brought them into existence without having been born through men and natural science and all the things. Now, let me demonstrate this. Who is it it would refer to? Well, obviously, the angels, because God just zapped them. They didn't come from anywhere. God created them on the spot. Also, in the Gospel of Luke, in the genealogy, that is there, tracing Jesus' ancestry, right back to Adam. When you get to Adam, all right, you've got sort of Cain, Abel, the son of Adam, the son of God. 
Adam was the son of God because God created him miraculously. He didn't come from man. Can you see that? Eve wasn't a son of God because she came from the man. But Adam was the son of God because he came directly into existence through the agency of God without coming from men or previously existing beings apart from God. Also in the scripture, Israel. The nation Israel is referred to as the sons of God. Well, why is this? Right, for a simple reason, I'm a Brit because my parents are Brits and they're Brits because they were brought up in Britain, all right? But with the Jews, they're the one nation in the world who existed as a people before they got a land. For us, our national identity comes from the land we live in. But the exception of the Jews is that they existed and then later on God gave them a land. Can you see that? So the Jews were Jews before they even realised what Canaan was like. Now Abraham, he wasn't a Jew, all right? he was a Gentile, he was an idol worshipper. God called him, he got saved. And God said, right, you're going to be a new people. And can you see, Abraham was the first Jew, okay, but he didn't come from a previously existing Jew. Therefore, the Jewish people, as God's choice, are the sons of God in this sense. They didn't come from man. And also, after Abraham, in order to continue the true Jews, it had to come through Isaac. And Isaac was born by the direct intervention of God, a miracle baby, okay? So again, on the same thing, Israel are the sons of God. Now then, can you understand now why Jesus is the Son of God? Because we have to be careful with this. Jesus is not a literal Son of God in the same way that I'm the Son of my Father. Now, some Christians actually seem to believe this, and of course it's completely wrong. You see, Jesus has existed from eternity. In the beginning there was God, and God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Only in their original state, they weren't the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They were three persons, but the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit only came about as titles in relationship to us, that creation. I mean, um, Jesus wouldn't have called Father, Father right back at the beginning. But when did Jesus start to call God Father when he came to earth as a baby? All right, that's when the Father and the Son thing began. Not in the Old Testament. The second person of the Trinity was not the son of the first person of the Trinity in the Old Testament or throughout eternity past. This is when Jesus was born. And the reason that Jesus was the Son of God is because he was created, he came into the world, he exchanged one mode of existence as divine for another one as an ordinary human being. But in order to become an ordinary human being, he came about by the direct supernatural agency of God. He didn't have a father. You see that? So Jesus, all right, he had a human mum, but Jesus didn't come from man. He came directly from God. And from that point onwards, Jesus became the son of God. All right? He changed his mode of life existence and because he was created zap pal in a supernatural way he didn't come from man therefore he too was the son of god in a unique way and the unique thing about him is that adam he was the son of god and god zapped him into being but adam hadn't existed before the angels got zapped into being but they hadn't existed before israel got zapped into being but there hadn't been an israel up to that time. But the thing with Jesus, when he was zapped into being, he existed before but in a different state. So Jesus is the Son of God by virtue of being a direct result of the agency of God and not being born as a result of man. Now that leaves one other group in the Bible who are sons of God. Would anyone like to hazard a guess who they are? Us. Us. <laughs> and why are we sons of God? All right, I'll tell you. I'm a son of God because 15 years ago I believed on Jesus. I was born again. I became a new creation. And the new me was zapped into existence on the spot. Can you see? I'm born again spiritually, not by the will of man, but the will of God. So therefore we are sons of God as well. Now that's why the angels are called sons of God. All right? That's a little detail. Back to the point now. Right, in Job chapter 1. Can I just ask you, don't believe yeah. that Jesus says Father in heaven now you don't believe he calls his father because i mean the bible says that he's interceding for us isn't he yeah. in heaven before the father oh that's right so, because jesus now is always going to be god's son but he wasn't before you see that's the point so now jesus calls the father father because god the father is jesus's father 
but he wasn't before. You see what I mean by that? Once Jesus became a man, he wasn't a man before, he became a man of the Incarnation. And the point is that... the Bible says that his name is above every other name, so he's no less now than what he was before. You're saying that... Oh, I don't quite follow actually what you're trying to say. Christine thinks that Jesus, by saying that he calls his Father, Father in heaven now, mm-hmm. she seems to... Well, she says it does seem like this, that he's a little bit less now than what he was before. <laughs> oh, I see. Right, right, right. right. So, do you follow what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, trying, yeah, yeah, that's right. More than that, indeed, when Jesus came to earth, he was made a little lower than the angels, yeah. let alone lower than the Father. He was made lower than the angels. Yeah. But the point is that Jesus, he humbled himself unto death, and now God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, the Philippians. Mm-hmm. So the point is that Jesus became a man, or the second person of the Trinity became a man, but now he has been glorified as a man. Jesus is still a man. He's still God. He was always God. Jesus never stopped being God. Never. He's always, you can't stop being God. Jesus is God himself, the second person of the Trinity. But he became a man, and now he's in heaven. All the power and the glory that he laid aside in order to come, he's got all that back, but he's remaining in the form of a man, you see. So as a man, he's still calling God his Father, but the point is that now there's a man in heaven. God became a man so that a man could be his God. Do you see what I mean by that? Is, is, is that a bit clearer or, or not? In a sense that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I mean, Jesus was always God. That's what's so wonderful about it is that the second pers- person of the Trinity, who is forever God, is now forever man also. That's right. That, that's that's marvellous because that means that we have. Well, I mean, where does that that's put right. us? You see what I mean? It's, yeah, it's great. Mm-hmm. That means that as men and women, when we're glorified, we can be exactly like Jesus, exactly like God Himself. And we shall, when we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John yeah, says. But, I mean, if he's letter. glorified now. It's not as a man in heaven, is he? Yeah, he is. He's a glorified man in heaven. He Jesus is a man. Body. That's right. When he rose That's again, he ate. Oh, yeah. He said to the disciples, "Touch me." Mm-hmm. You see, Jesus is a man, but he's a glorified man. And the gospel is that there's a man in heaven, and because there's one man in heaven. In Hebrews it says Jesus went as a forerunner, and the idea of the forerunner is that he goes to clear away the way for others to follow. And because there's one man in heaven, that means there can be loads of us. Can you see that? And we'll be glorified just like Jesus. Mm. That was the whole idea of God coming down to earth as a man, to become a man, to die as a man, and then to, to overcome sin as a man, because it was man who had the sin problem, not God and then to die, pay the price for sin, and then to be raised up and exalted back in his divine state, but as a man. And because of that, we can follow, because we're men as well. Yeah. <laughs> Is it true to say that before, before, the, the, uh, before Jesus came to earth into Mary, he, he was Christ. Is, is it, is it the, the use of the name as, as part of Elohim, as part of the, the, the Trinity God, he was Christ, but then he became man so that he could take our sins. Well, no, Christ is a title. It's not a name, it's a title. Christ means the anointed one. Um, but it's always... It's, it's seeing that Jesus, all right, when he was born as a baby, had just taken on a new identity, a new identity, a new mode of existence. Before that time, he was in heaven in his natural divine state. But then he laid that aside and he poured himself out and he humbled himself to become like a man, to become a man. And it was in that state that he lived and died, paid the price for sin. But it was in that state as well that he ascended into heaven. And because he's ascended into heaven, so can we as men and women. So God became man so that man can now share in the Godhead itself. That is the glory of the Gospel, that we can share in the very divine life of God through Jesus, and we'll end up glorified in heaven. That's the very that, you know, the uh, the Bishop of Durham and all those uh, are sort of saying that he didn't rise from the dead in his bodily form. That's right. Yes, but to say that he ascended into heaven in his bodily form, he did, but the Bible says he Mm. did. That's right. But then, flesh and blood can't enter heaven, can it? Pardon? Flesh and blood can't enter heaven. 
No, flesh and blood cannot enter into heaven unless it's flesh and blood whose spirit has been born again. When Jesus said flesh and blood can't inherit heaven, he wasn't saying that flesh and blood can't get in heaven, but it means that the way you get into heaven is through believing in Jesus yeah, and I'm being born again in your Jesus spirit. Jesus rose again oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in physical form and, and went into heaven. In That's right. Form. Because they watched him go. Didn't they? They they watched him. That's right. Disciples watched him go, and then and then the angel said to them, "Well, this why are you standing looking into heaven? The same Jesus is going to come back in like manner." And when he comes back again, he will be in a bodily form, just as the way they saw him go. He would come back. But his resurrection body was different to to Mary Magdalene because she didn't know him, did she? Um, Didn't know him in the gardens. Yeah, I think probably the reason. Yeah, but I think the reason Mary didn't know him in the gardens because she was crying. She couldn't see properly. Um, so I don't think the resurrection body is a different, a different. Yeah, because uh, yeah, he's well, it's different. Mary, but it's touch me, didn't he? I've always yeah, that, that might have been in the fourth dimension. Oh no, 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 no! Nothing to do with being in the fourth dimension. The reason that Mary wasn't allowed to touch him was because Jesus had just been raised from the dead, and as I mean, he was a sacrifice, and once he rose again from the dead, he was the first fruit of the harvest. All right. Now, the first fruit of the harvest has to be given to God, not man. And when Jesus rose again from the dead, he had to go to his father because he was the first fruit. That's why Mary couldn't touch him. But later on that day, that's right, the perfect sacrifice. But later on that day, he said, touch me. You see, it wasn't because he wasn't physical. Jesus, at one point, he said, look, see me. A spirit does not have flesh and, bo uh, flesh and bones as I do. And Jesus went out of his way to prove to the early Christians that now that he, w that he was alive from the dead, he was physical, and he was. But the body he had was vastly different in nature to the one he had before. It was still him, though. It was Jesus, same colour eyes, same nose, same ears. The same as for us. When we get our new bodies, it will be us. But it will be different a new mode of existence yeah, but, he could, but our he new just, well, he could just disappear and appear again i mean he could dissolve his yeah. arms and, and just that's right appear again. That's right. That's what I mean. You couldn't do it. You can't do that in the physical body, can we? Oh, no. can't oh, do that. oh yeah. So I see what. <laughs> well, yeah. I suppose it's the point that in his glorified state, Jesus is the master of time and space. Therefore, Jesus can. I mean, he's not restricted to the speed of light or anything like that. He's the very creator. Now, the point is that the same power that Jesus had once he rose again from the dead, we will have that because our body is going to be the same as his. This is the whole point. God becomes a man so that man can share in the glory of God. Mm. You see. So Jesus now in heaven, he's a man. The God-man. The glorified man. Hence, in the New Testament, um, I mean, sort of, um, it says that he's seated on the right hand of God. Well, if the Bible says he's seated on the right hand of God, you've got to have a body to do that, haven't you? Um, and also, when Stephen was being stoned to death, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And the point was, in honour of Stephen, Jesus stood up, he got off from his chair, and he was applauding him, because Stephen was undergoing martyrdom, and Jesus stood up to receive him into heaven, because that's where he went as soon as he died. So the point is that in heaven, Jesus now is a man. And if he's interceded before God for us, continually, he must be standing before God as well as sitting down beside God. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the Bible says he is our great high priest, and the great high priest has got to be a man. He's also God. Also God. He has never stopped being God. It was a transferal of the mode of existence. Yeah, it, al it almost seems as if because he's interceding for us, that it makes it makes him less, doesn't it? Oh, in a sense. Goodness. No. I don't know, maybe I should have said that, but in a sense I can't help it. You know, you can look at it, and if he's actually interceding for us, because he gets all his prayers answered, you say, so that's why we don't. <laughs> he's in with Father. Yeah, I think that the point is, you know, he is equal with God. He is God. He is God, absolutely, one hundred percent. But he intercedes for us because because he's he's our representative. Yeah. Satan accuses us. Um, Jesus, you know, stands before the Father, and uh, I mean, there's a chorus we sing something about when we see him. When 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 you he's, when people see us, they see Jesus. Or when God sees us, he sees Jesus. Hmm. See what I mean? Because, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I believe he is equal with God. Oh, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. oh yeah, I mean, it's not that he's equal with God, he is God himself. That's what being equal with God means. Yeah. Jesus is the second person 
in the Trinity. Um, but what happens is that in status, I mean, Jesus is God, so is the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all equal. But in Corinthians, Paul says that the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Now, the point is that a man and a woman are equal, all right? And God and Jesus are equal. But for the point of function, in regards to work being done, Jesus said, right, Father, I will submit to you for the sake of the job being done. Now, that submission doesn't mean he's less than God, but it means he said, I'm going to be the one who submits, and I'm only going to do what you say, Father, you see. So that doesn't mean he's less. It means that he's humbled himself, and that is the nature of God. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, if, um, if, say, another Bible teacher sort of came in here tonight, and I, for instance, said, well, I feel that, that I'd rather have him teach than me because I think God can bless you more, all right? I'm humbling myself. Well, I'm not any less than him. I'm still a man created in the image of God. Can you see it's a functioning thing? Mm. I don't become less than a man because I submit to a man. I'm just saying for the sake of doing the job, I think, you know, I'll submit, you see? And that's how it is with Jesus and with God, you see? And uh, so, I don't know if that... Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, it's doubly God, isn't it? It's God by divinity, from the, always was a God. And then through crucifixion Calvary, he's a God by right. No, no, he's okay. not. Because it's... Always fitted, always for groups of worthy. So yeah, but not. there are no degrees of God. No. You see. I mean, um, you can't have a 90% man. You can only have a man. He's either a man or he's not a man. You can't have a percentage of a man. You can't have a percentage of a woman. If, if there's someone standing in front of you, they're either a woman or they're not. They're not half, half of one, except they are a woman. All right? And there's no percentages. Now, it's the same with Jesus. There, I mean, he is God. He always has been God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He was God, he is God, and he always will be God. That cannot change. But we're talking about the differences in the mode of existence in order to get a job done. Because the problem that God had, not that God ha you know, has problems, but the point was that the job that had to be done is that men and women who God had created had sinned. So the problem was man and woman, so God becomes a man to sort the problem out. And then, uh, once he's done the job and sorted it out, he ascends back into heaven, which is his home, but he goes back as a man. So God became a man and didn't bother to change back. And that's the gospel. <coughs> The second person of the Trinity became a man, like you and I, which and when he got... Which is why Jesus said the Father is greater than I when he was on earth, because he was in fleshly form. And also because he had bowed the knee to the Father and said, I will do only what you tell me to do. Mm -hmm. But the point so is... So God is the controller, more or less, by Jesus' choice, or, or no? That's right, God. simply that the second person yeah. of the Trinity said to the first person of the Trinity, I submit to you. Yeah. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, has decided, right, I will submit to him, Jesus. Hence, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus and Jesus shows the Father. <coughs> it's just mutual arrangement. All three of them are God, you see. Mm. But they're not, not necessarily fighting. in the order God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. No, absolutely equal. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was raised from the dead. That's right. The Father is fully God. Yeah. The Son is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. When Jesus became a man, he was fully God. But he was fully God, become fully a man. So once he was fully God, then he became fully God and fully man, and then he decided, right, I'm going to stay fully man, and ascended back into heaven. But for the period that he was uh, fully a man on earth, mm. he had divested himself of his right and his authority and his glory. That's right. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair. That's he right. was as weak as we are. That's right. The only thing was he was sinless. Because yeah. he didn't have a human father, that was the advantage he had. Mm. But he suffered and was tempted, uh, a bit in a way which we can scarcely imagine. Yeah, that's right. Could but otherwise... Yeah. 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 Um, you said he was like us when he was on the earth, right? Did he have to call out to God for his power, or did he have, or did he have his power? Because when he was on the cross he could call out for the angels, or well, could he? Yeah, at any point he could have done. The whole point was, when the second person of the Trinity <laughs> became a man, all right? And we have Jesus on the earth. Now, Jesus is the very creator. Through him, all things were created. All right? But what he did is the problem was men and women. So what he did, when he became a man, and a man, he said, right, I am only going to exercise the power of a man. At any point, Jesus could have healed someone, but he didn't. Do you know what he did? 
He simply received the gift of the Holy Spirit from his father. Mm. Now, Jesus could have healed anyone he wanted, but he didn't. Do you remember what he said? He said, I do only what I see my father doing. All right? And what happened was that the, the, the power and the glory that Jesus had as his own, you know, it was in him. Inherently, he was God. What he did is he divested himself of all that when he came down from heaven. He didn't divest himself of being God, because you can't stop being God. He didn't divest himself of his divine nature, but he divested himself of his divine power, and he became a powerless man, just like we are. Therefore, when Jesus worked a sign or a wonder, like, for instance, when he had the Pharisees sitting there, murmuring away in their hearts against him, he used to tell them what they were thinking. Now, that wasn't because Jesus could read minds. Now, if Jesus had wanted to read minds, he could read minds. No problem whatsoever. But men and women can't read each other's minds. And when God becomes a man, he does it properly. Therefore, Jesus, in the state he was in, divested himself of all his power, he couldn't read minds either. He could have done if he wanted to, but he laid all that aside. So he knew what they were thinking, because the Holy Spirit gave him a word of knowledge. Just the same as you and I. May I just make a lovely point, which I think it sort of illustrates his limitation, just like you're saying. There's one case where he's laying hands on somebody who's blind, and I think laid hands on him, he said, well, can you see now? And this bloke says, well, I can see men walking like trees. So you can imagine Jesus saying, oh, well, you know, let's pray again. Yeah. Now, I think that is lovely, yeah. because he wasn't healed, his bloke wasn't healed instantaneously. Mm. It shows, and it's to encourage us that we're limited to exactly the same way to the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. So all that power that Jesus had, he didn't draw on his own power, he drew only on the power of his Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that means that Jesus lived in the world in exactly the same way that you and I can do. Jesus had no advantage over us whatsoever. Even the fact that he didn't have a sinful nature isn't an advantage because Adam and Eve didn't have a sinful nature but they still sinned. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Jesus had no advantages. Now then, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Jesus lived his life, a perfect life, simply through the power of the Father. And he said, right, I've done it, now you do it and draw on my power. Because Jesus is back in heaven, he's received all his power back now. And in the same way that Jesus just relied, he said, I do only what I see the Father doing. We are to live in exactly that same way. Jesus only let, Jesus merely let the Father do things through him. He said the Son can do nothing of his own accord. And then Jesus said to the church in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, all that does is place us in the same situation that Jesus was in. He said, I can do nothing on my own accord. I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus allowed himself to be a channel of his Father through the power of the Holy Spirit to come through him. And that is what we're called to do. That is what the Christian life is. He did use his Godhead power when they were in the boat and he, he stilled the wind and the waves because that was his no, he didn't. power as a creator God, wasn't it? Yeah, but he wasn't drawing on his own power. He simply spoke the word of authority in faith and knew that his father would back him up. And that's what it is for us, to speak the word of faith knowing that because we're using Jesus' name... Yeah. But Jesus didn't still any storms in his own power. I can show you this very, very clearly. And I ask this question, why did Jesus need to be baptised with the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you, because he didn't know the power of the Holy Spirit until he was baptised with the Spirit, just the same as you and I. The only difference was that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit from birth. And Jesus was literally born of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit came into the Virgin Mary. And, and, and therefore, he came into existence. So Jesus was born again from birth, unlike us, all right? We have to get born again later on. But then as a man, Jesus was baptised with the Spirit. And it was only then that he started doing signs and wonders. Why? Because it was the power of the Holy Spirit doing it through him. Jesus could have done it in his own power any time he liked. But the point was, he said, I'm not going to use my power. They haven't got any power. In order to be their great high priest, I've got to be able to identify with them. I'm not going to use my power. I shall simply rely on Father and the Holy Spirit, my team. And that puts him in exactly the same state as you and I are in, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are there now all the time saying, do you want to do it in your power, or would you like us to do it through you? Ah, yes. 
You see? So it's absolute equality. So Jesus became like us so that now we can be like Jesus, in heaven glorified as men and women, you see. Is, is, is that clear? Well, we are up there, aren't we? Up with Jesus. Seated up with Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Spiritually, we are. In our spirits, our spirits are one with Jesus. It's mind blowing all this, isn't it? Yeah. Our spirits are one with Jesus. All right? Now then, Jesus is now seated in heavenly places. And that is our position in Jesus. Now, one day, that will be our position quite physically. At the moment, it's by virtue of the fact that our spirits are joined with Jesus, and Jesus is in heaven. Jesus is also living through us as well. But physically, he's in heaven, and our spirits are joined with him. So our position in Christ is that we're in heavenly places, you see. Lord says it's a schoolroom. That's right. <laughs> Does, is that, does that clear that up? Because... We're dealing with angels. <laughs> I have to go now. I'm just starting. Okay? So, right. Are people ready to move back to the angels? Okay? Right. That was a, a long detour on what it means to be the Son of God. Okay. Now then, Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Now remembering that in the Old Testament, the sons of God, or morning stars, are the angels. <laughs> I could also just quickly tell you as well why the angels are called the morning stars, all right? Okay, I'll throw this in, because it's fantastic to know this. Once you see the pattern, you understand where we fit into it. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. In creation, there is always an order. There's an hierarchy, spiritually. And the order was this. It was God, it was the angels, it was man, and then it was animals, etc., etc., now, when Jesus was born, in Hebrews, we're told he became a little lower than the angels. Why? Because he became a man. And on the scale of creation and power and glory, the angels are above men. Therefore, the morning stars refers to those beings, those persons, who are number one in creation. All right? Now, in the Old Testament, who was number one? It was the angels, all right? There was God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, then the angels in power and glory, then men. So in the Old Testament, all right, the um, angels are called the morning stars. Now then, Jesus, he comes from heaven, he becomes a man, and he becomes a little lower than the angels. So now the order is that you've got God, the Father, and the Son in heaven and the Spirit, then you've got the angels, then you've got man, and Jesus has now become a man, all right? And then you've got the animals underneath. But then, what happened after Jesus died on the cross? Well, we've already said it. That Jesus ascended into heaven as a man. And therefore, there is a change in the order. And if you read through the New Testament, who is now called the morning star? Jesus and the sons of God, Christians. Because we are in heaven with Jesus. So now, therefore, because of that, as men and women, we're above the angels because God is. So the order has changed. Now it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then us on an equal footing with Jesus, then the angels, then unregenerate men and women, and then all the animals. So, in fact, now we're the morning stars. And can you see, we're the morning stars and the sons of God. We are now higher than the angels because we're believers. So we because can't, sorry, we can't ask the angels to protect over. You know, you hear sometimes people saying, I ask the angels to protect. It's more than that. Not only can you pray, Lord, you know, I mean, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth for those who are being saved. All right? Ministering spirits, serving spirits. Now, don't ever pray to angels. Don't ever talk to angels. The ones that talk to you, when you ask them to, are demons, all right? So don't ever try and talk to angels, all right? But the point is that certainly you can pray that the Father will protect you, not only with the power of the Holy Spirit, but you can pray, Lord, and send the angels to protect me as well. So not only can you ask Father to send you some angels to guard you. But not only that, they stand to attention and salute you when they arrive, because you are now higher than the angels. Can you see? So in the Old Testament, the angels were the, the most glorious part of the creation of God, below God only. So you had God, angels, men, and women. But now, the sons of God and the morning stars are us. 
Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the morning star in Peter, all right? And um, so, therefore, Jesus is the Son of God and the morning star. We are glorified in Jesus. So the order is now God, Christians, believers, then the angels, then unbelievers. So we're higher than the angels now. Now, remember Paul in Corinthians. The Corinthians are fighting things out amongst themselves and they're taking each other to court. And Paul says, he says, look, don't sort out problems in the church by dragging your brother into court. You know, don't let unbelievers sort out the problems of the church. He says, judge your problems yourself. And he says, don't you know that we will judge angels? See, that's the position we've got. Jesus judges men. Jesus judges us. But the angels are judged by us, all right? So we're judged by Jesus, the angels by us. Because God is above us, but we are above the angels, you see. Now, with that kind of authority, if the angels now salute us, the angels who are, um, I mean, the good angels, who, who throughout eternity have stood by the very throne of God, with God face to face throughout eternity, if they salute us, what on earth do the demons do when we use the name of Jesus against them? And if we could only believe what they do, they scarper. They're terrified of us. The problem is we don't believe they're terrified of us. All right. <coughs> now then, let me just show you one other thing. Let's develop this. If you turn to Jude, turn to Jude, and I'll just show you the power and the authority that we have. Now then, find Jude and verse 9. Just before Revelation. Right, just before Revelation. Jude and verse 9. <laughs> right, I'll give you just the quick necessary background in order to understand this verse. <laughs> Jude and verse 9. Have you got it? Now then, let me explain the background to it. In history, as far as we know, there have been two men who never died. They went straight to heaven. One was Enoch, one was Elijah. You'll remember they were just translated straight into heaven. Now, in the tribulation... All right, after the church has gone home to heaven and God starts dealing in the Jews to get Israel back into his plan and into his will, what happens is that he sends two men into Jerusalem to work incredible signs and wonders and to preach the gospel. All right. Now then, we know that those two men, they're not Elijah and Enoch who never died, they're Elijah and Moses. It's not Enoch, because Enoch isn't a Jew, and these two men are prophets to the Jews, and God doesn't send Gentile prophets to the Jews, all right? They're Jews. One is Elijah, who never died, but the other one is Moses. And we can test that, because when Jesus got transfigured, who were there talking with him? Elijah and Moses. Mm. And they were both physical. Elijah, we know, he never died, but lo and behold, there is Moses physically alive. Now, my goodness, what happened? Because, as you know, for... Everyone who dies at the moment, all right, for us, if we're saved, we go to heaven, but in our soul. We don't get our, um, a new body until the rapture. But here is Moses, Elijah and Enoch, no problem. They never died. They never lost their bodies. They just went straight to heaven physically. But Moses lost his body. Well, how come he's got one and no one else has? <coughs> and it's because Moses is a very special man in the plan of God. And the point is this, Moses, with Elijah, is going to be a witness in the last days to Israel. And through the appearance of Elijah, the prophets, and Moses, the law, the law and the prophets, Israel are going to be saved. All right. Now then, the whole thing is that, therefore, something mighty funny must have gone on in regards to the death of Moses. We must expect that his death was unlike anyone else's in this sense. Now then, you'll remember when Moses died at the end of Deuteronomy. But we know that he died, all right? He went out into the mountains to die. And they went out to find his body, but they never, they never found his body. Nothing particularly unusual about that. I mean, a lion could have eaten it or something like that, or red ants or something, you know, or the vultures. Mm -hmm. Nothing strange about that. But the point was, we must bear in mind that in the Old Testament, Moses' body was never found. Now, we have to wait until the last but one book in the New Testament to find out what happened. And what we discover is that in actual fact... God reclaimed the body of Moses because he wanted to raise Moses from the dead immediately and take him back to heaven to wait until um, the seven-year judgment on the earth when Moses will go and finish his ministry to Israel. And this is the verse that tells us about it. And what happened was that God sent the archangel Michael down to the earth to get the body of Moses. Now remember, Moses died, okay, 
And what happened was that God sent down Michael to get his body, all right, and then take his body up into heaven so that Moses' soul could be brought out of the centre of the earth and he could go up to heaven where Enoch was and where Elijah was, all right. So they're the only three believers who, before Jesus ascended, were in heaven. All the rest of them were down in the centre of the earth in paradise, all right. So then, here we see that, Moses, that the Archangel Michael is sent off on the mission to get, get Moses' body for me. That's what God says. Now then, Satan knew that if God wanted the body of Moses, then there's got to be a very, very good reason for that. So, God, so Satan decided that he wouldn't let God have the body. And so there's a punch-up. All right? Okay? Now then, and in verse 9, we read about this punch-up. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil... Now, this is Satan himself in a punch-up with the archangel Michael. Michael's gone to get the body, and he's met Satan head-on, all right? And Satan is more powerful than the archangel Michael. Satan is the highest-ranking angel ever created. So Michael, on his own, doesn't stand a chance, all right? So then, the Archangel Michael, I mean, it'd be like putting me up against Big Daddy. I mean, there's just no comparison. <laughs> when, when the Archangel Michael, when the Archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, here's the point. The Archangel Michael, who's a goodie, is confronted on a job by Satan, who is a baddie. But the problem is that Satan is more powerful than Michael because Satan was the head, the chief, the number one angel. In fact, in the Bible, before, before this glorious angel fell and got the name Satan, or the devil, he had another name. And do you know what it was? Lucifer. And do you know what Lucifer is? It means, yeah, it means morning star. Because he was, he was the morning star of the morning stars. He was the Son of God, of the sons of God. He was the most powerful angel. Mm -hmm. He was much stronger than any of the others. Probably why a third of them decided to go with him. Perhaps they had a good chance. So here is Michael, and he's outgunned by Satan. Michael cannot manhandle Satan and win this fight. It's just not on. Therefore, how is it that Michael can win? Well, I'll tell you. By appealing to someone, <laughs> Satan is more powerful than the archangel Michael. So in order to get Satan out of the way, the Archangel Michael has to appeal to someone who is stronger than Satan. And what he does is he says this, the Lord rebuke you. Now when he did that, Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. And in saying that, God himself dealt with Satan. But the thing to notice is this, Michael said as an angel to Satan, he said, the Lord rebuke you. And he had to do that because Satan was higher than him. He had to appeal to higher authority. So, when the Archangel Michael was confronted with Satan, he had to appeal to higher authority to get Satan out of the way. But when you and I, as believers, are confronted with a demon or Satan himself, do we say, the Lord rebuke you? No, we say, I rebuke you, because we are higher, we are more powerful than Satan. Can you see the difference? And this shows that we are more powerful than the angels. Can you see what I'm saying? Angel against angel, they have to appeal to God as the authority. But the point is, for us, when we come up against the demons, what did Jesus say? He says, I give you authority. We have that authority, all we have to do is use it. You see, we're more powerful. We are a higher order than creation, as believers, than angels are. Before we were born again, we were lower than the angels. But when you got born again, you move up to number one in creation with Jesus. And everything else is under your feet. That's what it means. The devil is under our feet. We have authority over him. Right, at long last, Job, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 6. Excuse we, me, who wants the windows? Oh, excuse me, excuse it's too me. cold. Just pull the windows too. Yeah. If we've all got this, which we have, right, this so much authority over the devil, and we, we'll believe it, I think, right? How come Satan's doing so much in the world? And there's so many Christians about who can keep it under our foot. Right, you've got to distinguish Satan is free to move in the world of unbelieving man. Because unbelieving man has no authority over the devil. In fact, the Bible says that the devil is the god of this world. And he is the god of this world. Satan has authority over this world. Because the world of men who are rebelling against God are less powerful than Satan. 
Therefore, in this world, we would expect to see Satan using his power. But what the, the whole point is, is that when we as believers move into situations, we can bind his power and change it, change that situation for the glory of Jesus. And the great problem is that, yes, we say we know we have authority over Satan, and we say, yes, we do believe that we have authority over Satan, but the problem is we believe it, yes, but only as a doctrine. We don't really believe it. And that's where we have to do repenting. Because we are new creations in Christ Jesus. But the old creation in Jeremiah is said to be under an evil heart of unbelief. And our problem is we live in our evil hearts of unbelief. When we should be living in the new creation, in the faith of Jesus himself. And whereas we can be saying one thing with our lips doctrinally, when it boils down to it, we're living out of unbelief. We're not living, you know, our, our authority over Satan is a doctrine to us. Now the Holy Spirit wants to make it an experience and to bring what we believe as a doctrine to be our experience. And the fact that you believe the doctrine doesn't mean that you've got the experience. Because it is absolutely true, each one of us in this room, we're all born again here, we're all Christians, Satan is terrified of us, but he's clever. He's clever. He knows that him versus me as a Christian and him versus you as a Christian is like putting me up against Big Daddy. And when it comes to the devil, we're Big Daddy. He has not got a chance. But if I was put in a fighting ring and said, right, you're going to wrestle Big Daddy, if I could convince Big Daddy that I was going to wipe the floor with him, Big Daddy would let me. Can you see what I mean? If I could con Big Daddy into thinking that if he takes one step towards me, I'm going to wipe the floor with him, Big Daddy isn't going to take one step towards me. When I take a step towards him, he'll cower, and then I'll jump all over him. The only power that the devil has over us is the power of bluff. But the point is, we believe his bluff. We believe his lies. What we've got to do is to call his bluff. You see, Amen. Satan is under my feet, which Amen. means this. I have the power to crush Satan any time I like, because I've got the authority of Jesus. Amen. It's not because I'm special, it's because I've got Jesus living in me. And every word I speak in Jesus' name, Jesus backs up. Therefore, Satan, I can squidge him any time I like. But the problem is, if Satan can throw problems at me, if Satan can keep reminding me of all my sins and failure, if Satan can fill my mind with the junk rather than the good news of Jesus Christ, then the point is, he'll convince me that he's on top of me. He'll convince me that the problems are too much for me. And when I'm convinced of that, I'll lie down and Satan will walk all over me. Now, that is why we're defeated. But the point is, that, that's not because Satan has got any power over us. It means we've let him. We have given him the power of our own free will. Yeah. All we have to do is get up, brush ourselves down, and by the time we've done that, and by the time Satan realises that we've twigged, he'll be gone before you've got up. Can you see that? It's calling Satan's bluff. Mm -hmm. But we've got to do that. And it's the work the Holy Spirit's doing in us. And, and the Holy Spirit, he does have to bring us to freedom from this evil heart of unbelief. Can I just confirm that, you know, in all the years of deliverance ministry, which we seem to get quite a bit of down the years, um, this is absolutely true that the devil is completely defeated. You see? It's, it's true, if you believe it. But we've been kidded that, you know, yeah. it's not a so. We had to learn yeah. that it is true and we have the authority. Yeah. We believe it. It happens. Yeah. There are certain things, I mean, like, say for me personally, things that I know I'm not free. My experience is bondage. But I know in the power of the law that when I was born again, I was set free. There's no two ways about that. I am free from sin. I do not have to sin anymore. All right? And in, in various areas of my life, I've experienced that. Things that I could never have been free of, I'm free of. And every time it's happened, not be, I mean, the struggling with it and the repentance is very, very important. But by the time my freedom comes, after all the struggling and failure I've done, often I, I, I look back and I think, crikey, for the last few weeks I've been free. And the victory has become, come so imperceptibly you realise that you're free. But the problem we've got are the areas where we're still in defeat. And the truth of those areas for me is this. I know the doctrine. I know in my head. I believe the word of God that I'm free. But the point is that every time Satan tells me I'm not, 
in my heart, I keep believing him. <laughs> Do you see that? Mm. And because I believe him, and there's a law in the universe, and the law is this, according to your faith, be it unto you. Yeah. And if Satan comes along and says, you're beaten, that's got you. Mm. You believe it. Faith is belief. So that's what you get. And indeed, if you don't believe you're free of something, mm. you'll carry on in bondage to it. But the Holy Spirit is working to reveal to us supernaturally that we are free. And it's when we're believing God, and not the devil, but the point is, this believing God, this true faith, is more than just believing a set of facts. We must believe the facts, we must state them, we must confess them. But the deliverance comes when what we're stating in our minds drops down into our heart, as it were. All right. So all the struggling and the failure is the lead-up to seeing that victory. In Hebrews it says, let us strive to enter that rest. That's a contradiction, but it's not. It's by wearing yourself out in the flesh that you can't do it anymore, and that's when you realise that Jesus wanted to do it all the time, and it comes naturally. Mm. So you see, the work of the Holy Spirit is really to stop us believing Satan, you see. Mm. And that's you, how you, the victory comes. you think that still applies with sickness as well? Mm. I do, I do. Because mm. sometimes think we, can, we can hit our heads up against a brick wall. I mean, there can be thousands of Christians praying for one person. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Now then, in regards to sickness, you see, what we need to understand, there's one... Now then, there are people who teach that the Lord wants us to live in health, and I agree with them 100%. But some of them express it in such a way that is heresy. And the way they express it is this, and this is, you know, this is totally 100% wrong. They pray, if, if, if you could sit down and talk with them, I think they'd see it, but I don't think anyone has. But what they say is this, they say, by his stripes we are healed. Amen. On the cross we were set free from sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Amen. By his stripes we are healed. Amen. That's absolutely true. But what these people go on to say is they say, therefore you're not ill, you just think you are. Now that's the heresy, because the illness is real. Okay. But the point is that as we develop in the Holy Spirit this faith, we will be able to say to our bodies, and we will be able to say to each other, in Jesus' name, go! And it will go. Now we're taking a long time getting there. Fine, no problem, no problem. Let's not be discouraged by that. The important thing is that we keep our goal in view. And our goal is that Jesus wants us to be in health. All right. And that if we're living close to Jesus, if we're in fellowship with him, there is no reason at all why we need to suffer ill health. All right. And therefore, by faith, we can claim healing and we can stay in health. Now, in the meantime, until we're there, let's not worry about it. If you're ill, go to the doctor. If you can't get healed, no problem, use the doctor. But the point is this, keep knowing that the Holy Spirit is working in you so that one day you'll have the faith that you haven't got now. And as I've said here before, faith is now, all right? Faith is a now thing. Faith is when I say, I know this is true now, all right? So that when I sin, I confess it and I have faith, I know it's gone. I don't, you know, get too screwed up about it. But hope is the future. And the point is, if you cannot have faith for something, even though you know you ought to have, say you're ill, or say there's an area where Satan's jumping all over you, all right, you know, you know that you ought to have faith and be free, but you haven't, all right? Well, fine, no problem, don't get worried, repent that you haven't got the faith and have hope. And by hope, all I mean is this, trust the Lord and know for assurance that you might not have it now, but if you keep right with God and keep repenting of that defeat, he will give it to you. And one day that hope will turn into faith and the victory will come. Amen. So the important thing is where you're in defeat or where you're in illness or ill health, don't worry about it, don't get screwed up about it, because Jesus got screwed up on the cross for that. There's no need for us to get screwed up about it. Don't worry about your sin, confess it. And that includes unbelief. Confess it. But the point is that in doing that, all right, you haven't got the faith. But if you then condemn yourself, if you then worry, or even worse, if you try and whip your faith up, all you will do is to get so confused, so discouraged, you'll get out of fellowship with God, and the Holy Spirit can't turn that hope into faith. Stay at peace. Be in hope. Accept you haven't got the faith. Just accept that. Accept it. Don't be pressurised. I know the last book you read said you should have it, but you haven't got it, and nothing can change that. <laughs> so be at peace, all right? And then in that hope and in that peace, that's the environment when the Holy Spirit can work and turn your hope into faith. 
And whether it takes 10 days or 50 years, it'll happen. And let's supposing that you're one of these really unfortunate Christians who really screws things up, like me. And let's supposing that the very day you die, that you still haven't got victory there. Let me tell you, the moment you die, then you will have victory. <laughs> or say you're alive at the rapture. The moment the rapture takes place, then you'll have victory. Then you will be healed of whatever it is. So it's going to come one way or the other. But obviously it's much better that it can come here, isn't it? It's mm. much better. So let us strive towards that. But let's not get discouraged at our failings. Let your failings drive you to God, not into despair. Let your failings drive you to hope. The world is driven to despair by failing. We are driven to hope. And I'll tell you what that means, because in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about love. And it says that love believes, love hopes all things. Well, who is love? God is love. Jesus is love. Failure drives us to Jesus. See? So trust. So, Just be at peace. Sometimes, Beersford, um, I, I thought I was talking to Belinda once about this as well. That if sometimes you got you can pray for something and you've got so much faith it's untrue you know right and you pray about it and you really say right do it it doesn't <laughs> and i'll be so dumb <laughs> and i'll be so dumb because i've never had faith like that before right and i go because you sent it to me about it when it came out of petrol <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um you get so puzzled because you think oh, i can't think i have that much faith this is really right. zappy okay didn't. Yeah. right now in, in <laughs> our <laughs> training, <laughs> yeah right it's, it's an experience that lots of people have and it can be a bit of a devastating one until you know how to handle it and when you've learned how to handle it it won't bother you anymore and it's quite simply this you see it's one of those things we're looking at an experience that we have now what we've got to make sure at all times is that we believe what the bible says not what our experience says sometimes our experiences merely confirm the word of god but sometimes our experience is contrary to the word of god now the final authority for us is the scripture not our experience now the bible tells us quite clearly that where there is true faith that that mountain will move that's what the bible says the bible says that where there is faith you will be healed now we get into situations where wow we've got that faith and it doesn't happen now listen very carefully to what i say you've got to put the word of god first that was not faith but i understand fully that you were convinced and i was convinced at the time it happened it was faith as well but let me tell you it couldn't have been faith because if it was faith then you have become the first person that God has let down. And I've often said, I don't mind being the second person that God lets down, but I ain't going to be the first. <laughs> now, the point is, if, you, if, that, if in that experience, if that was faith, if it didn't happen, God let you down. And let me tell you, God did not let you down. Therefore, it wasn't faith. It looked like faith. It felt like faith. There was no other words you could put on it. But let me tell you, it wasn't faith. I like it. You see? And often I've had the experience, I've actually used this, this phrase, that um, sometimes I've felt I've had all the faith in the world. And there is the problem. Because the world has faith too. You see, faith is something that everyone's got. All right? I mean, you can't operate without faith. I mean, faith is trust. Faith is, is counting on something to happen. If you didn't have faith, you'd never sit down, you'd never get into a bed because you think it would collapse. And you see, you can't operate without faith. So there is human carnal faith, which is nothing to do with the Holy Spirit and with God at all. It's part of the flesh life. In exactly the same way that you can look at people and see human goodness, but that's got nothing to do with the righteousness of Jesus whatsoever, because human goodness isn't good enough, but the righteousness of Jesus is. Now, the faith, the true faith of Jesus works miracles. But the faith in the world don't do a thing. Can you see that? I mean, if you have faith that the chair's going to stay up when you sit on it, if it's a good chair and you've done it before, your faith will be proved true. But all I'm saying is that you can... I mean, when I got converted, there were lots and lots of things that I wanted to do for Jesus as I started doing them. Now, some of them really got blessed. In, in, in all that, that frenzy of, of ministry that I was doing, some of it, and I mean, the laws of averages said that with the amount I was doing, some of it had to be what God was doing. I mean, the law of averages demanded it. And as I look back, what God was doing through me was really tremendous, you know, and I saw fantastic things, really amazing what God did. But an awful lot of it 
was what I wanted to do for God. And it was all very right as well. But it wasn't what God was doing through me at the moment. So the point was that, that some of it, it was all jolly good stuff. And it, it, it was just the same in feeling as the stuff which proved to be of the Lord. But the stuff that was of the flesh was merely good intentions. And God doesn't bless good intentions. He blesses faith. You know, uh, I mean, according to your faith, not according to your good intentions. So therefore, you can do good works, which certainly look the same as someone who's doing good works in the spirit, but you can do that in the flesh. Now, in exactly the same way, you can have faith in the flesh. And even if you put that flesh and faith in Jesus, that is not the faith that moves mountains. We've already heard that Jesus is our great high priest and Jesus is interceding. Now, there's a very good reason for that. Because in the Psalms we're told, who can ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And it's the picture of someone going up the hill of the Lord, presenting themselves to God and asking, you know, making requests of God. And it's saying, who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? And it says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now when it comes to answers to prayer, I'm afraid you've got to count me out. Because I haven't got clean hands and a pure heart. I have in the sense that I've repented, I live in repentance, but I haven't got intrinsically clean hands and good heart. See? I haven't got it in me. Therefore, I can't expect to get my prayers answered. You can't either, because you haven't got clean hands and a pure heart. Not intrinsically. You've got it imputed to you. You've got Jesus' is reckoned to your account, but you haven't got it intrinsically as your own, of yourself. So therefore, who can ascend unto the hill of the Lord? All right? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who can pray to God and get what they're asking for? Jesus. Jesus. Because in order to have clean hands and a pure heart, firstly, you've got to be a man. Hands. See? Take the Bible literally and you won't go wrong. Therefore, we've got to find a man, but we've got to find a man who is also God. And when you've got a man who is God at the same time, or when God has become a man, then you've got someone who can get his prayers answered. Now, Jesus is praying. He's interceding for us in heaven all the time, 24 hours a day. That is his ministry now. That's what he's doing for us. In Romans 8 we find more than that. We find that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and through us with groans too deep for words. All right? So the Holy Spirit all the time is praying through us. Therefore, Jesus is praying for us in heaven. Now, you've got to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the whole point is this. Father had a fortune and he left it to his eldest son. But he didn't just want to leave it to his eldest son. He did, but he wanted other sons as well. And so the point was that the eldest son, whom father's fortune was left to, which means at any time, eldest son can write the cheque out and it's in his bank account, you see. But you see, the thing was that God wanted to share it. And so what happened was that there was a death in the family, right? <laughs> yeah, but well, there was a death in the family, right? So father had left his fortune to eldest son. And then there was a death in the family, and number one son died. Now, therefore, when someone dies, that inheritance that they've got, all right, so say you've got a very rich bloke, he's got an inheritance that has been handed down from someone else. If he dies, then that fortune, not only his, but what was handed down to him, is up for grabs in the will. So there was a death in the family and Jesus died. And he left us a will. And that will is all the riches he had that he's passing on, up for grabs, that he got from the father. Now then, you had loads and loads of little nippers starting to be born into the family. That's us, the sons of God. Now the inheritance has been passed on to us because there was a death in the family, all right? Jesus wrote his will out, and his will is that all his little brothers and sisters should get the inheritance, all right? So Jesus died, and in his will, he left everything he had for us. Now once he'd been died, that will was made, and you can't... Once the will has been made, you can't mess around with it in law. That couldn't be changed. That was fixed for all eternity. Now, our story becomes more than just a human one and different from the norm when we discover that number one son who just died and left us everything in his will, he's alive again, you <coughs> see? And he's up in heaven looking after everything, all right, that he's got. Now, there's an executor when you die. All right, my grandfather died a while ago. My, my mother and father are the executors. And the, the, the executors are there, or the executor of the will, is the one who says, this is what has been left. These are the people who it's been left to. And the job of the executor is to make sure that the person who's been left the inheritance gets it. All right? So the job of the executor 
is to pass the inheritance that's been left onto the person it was left to and make sure they receive that inheritance. Mm -hmm. Now then, so that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Everything left in the will, in fact, the very life of Jesus himself. Jesus himself, he left himself in his will. All right? And because he left himself in his will, not just him, but everything he had, the whole universe, now belongs to us. And Paul says this, he says, all things are Christ's, all right? Therefore, all things are yours. I mean, we are Christ's and everything is Christ, therefore everything is ours, you see. So then, Jesus and everything he's got, the whole universe, plus all the power of God, all right? Do you remember, Jesus said, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, all right? Now then, often you find in fairy stories, and it happens in history, when kings maybe fall madly in love with a princess, or maybe a soldier does a feat of extraordinary bravery, you see. And the king says, anything you ask to a third of my kingdom. Now, this is generous, all right? This is really generous. But you see, men can be generous, but God outdoes men at every time. And God doesn't say to us, anything you want up to a third of my kingdom, he says, here you are, here is my kingdom. Mm. And Jesus says that we've got the keys of the kingdom. You see that? Therefore, Jesus said, it is my Father's good pleasure to give you in the will that I now write out for you and I'm going to die so you can collect it, not a third of his kingdom, not half of his kingdom, not 90% of the kingdom, but the price is right, 100% of the kingdom, the whole lot. It's all been left to us. Now the Holy Spirit is the executor and his job is to pass on to us and make sure that we receive what has been left for us. And what has been left for us is the life of Jesus himself. Therefore, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the means whereby Jesus reveals his life in our body. So then, we have Jesus interceding for us in heaven. All right? The inheritance. Part of the inheritance, Jesus interceding. We have the Holy Spirit as the executor of the will praying through us in groans that can't be uttered in Romans 8. Now, when you put that together, what that means is this. Jesus is praying through us. That's what it means. Now then, we've established that the only person who can get answers to prayer has got to have clean hands and a pure heart. So first of all, he's got to have hands and a heart. He's got to be a man. Secondly, he's got to have clean hands and a pure heart. So therefore, he's got to be God. All right? So we've seen that there is one man who can get his prayers answered from God. And this same man is now, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, praying through us. Now, here's the difference. When you pray in your will, when you pray in your strength, which is what your will means, strength of will, your prayer cannot be answered, because I'm sorry, you haven't got clean hands and a pure heart. But when in your oneness with Jesus, Jesus prays through you, that prayer will guaranteed be answered. Can you see? That prayer will guarantee be answered. Therefore, the point is that when we've had this great faith, prayed and it hasn't happened, can you see it wasn't true faith? It looked like it, but it was us praying in our will in faith. And that's no good. We might well have been praying for something that we knew was right from the Bible. I've prayed for people, all right? I've prayed for healthy people who fell ill the next day. <laughs> all right. A healing ministry in reverse. Now then, but, a point, <laughs> but the whole point about that is that whereas I'm praying for something that I know is God's will from the Bible for healing, the point is, if it's God's will. But if I'm doing it in my will, in my strength, it can't be answered. But when it's Jesus doing it through me, then that healing will be there. And can you see, the Holy Spirit is working so that what we have in heaven, if you like, that inheritance, that faith of Jesus can be operating through us. But it will only be the faith of Jesus, not our faith at all. All right? Mm -hmm. Jesus talks all through the Bible about the, the grain of mustard seed. Do you remember at one point? Hang on. Oh, is it 10 o'clock? John hasn't done this question. <laughs> 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 That it's one thing to move in your faith, but it's another thing to move in the faith of Jesus. So what we're talking about is that you can have faith, but if it's your faith, that's no good. God will not bless your faith. 
but when the faith of Jesus is revealed in us. And in the King James, in Galatians 2.20, it's the only Bible that I've found, apart from a literal one, you can get literal sort of translations. The King James is the only one that gets Galatians 2.20 right. And Paul says, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And that's the literal Greek. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, in one of the Gospels as well, I can't remember which one, but in the modern translations, there's a place where Jesus says, have faith in God. And again, I believe... No, even the King James one gets this wrong. The King yeah, James yeah, translates it, have faith in God. But in the Greek, in the Greek, the word, you know, uh, a translation of it literally is have the faith of God. God. That's right. So, in fact, the teaching in the Scripture... It's not us putting our faith in Jesus. Us putting our faith in Jesus does absolutely nothing. The Christian life is that God has put his faith in us because he's put Jesus in us. All right, Jesus is in us. Now, in order to show that contrast, it's not our faith, it's the faith of Jesus. You remember there came a particular time when the disciples said to Jesus, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Now, we tend to think, when it comes to faith, we think of quantity. And it's that very concept which shows us that we don't understand faith. Because the answer that Jesus gives, they say, Lord, increase our faith. And they're saying, Lord, we haven't got very much, but if we get more, then we'll see more things happen. And the reply that Jesus gives is he says, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, be removed into the sea. Now the point is, the disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. We want more. And they thought if they got their, crease, their faith enlarged, if they had more faith, more would be done through them. And Jesus responds with, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. So the disciples are thinking in terms of quantity. But when Jesus says to them, he says, no, the faith, you, all you need is the size of a grain of mustard seed. Now Jesus speaks in terms of a quality of faith. Now when you put that together with something else that Jesus said, and he speaks about us, firstly himself and then us, about the corn of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. So let's take now, we've got a tiny mustard seed of faith, all right? But then we've got a corn of wheat, so we change the plant, a corn of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. All right? And when it's done that, it brings forth much fruit. Now when you put those things together, you get this. The disciples come up and they say, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus says to them, he says, no, not only am I going to increase your faith, because your faith is useless, it's the wrong kind anyway. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take your faith and I'm going to kill it off. And when you've lost your faith, then you'll have my faith. Can you see the difference? As long as we move in our faith, we're just not going to see it. We'll see glimpses here and there. There'll be the times when the true faith flashes through us and we see miracles. But what I'm talking about is the consistent, miraculous, day-to-day -day supernatural walk that Jesus has in store for us, all right? Where the sick are consistently healed. You see what I mean? For instance, I mean, healing isn't the only sign of power we need. It's one of them. There are loads of others as well. When the sins that still bind us, when confronted with this faith in us, they will drop away and we will be free. We can be free now, but we're moving out in our faith. But when we move in the faith of Jesus, they'll fall away. But can you see, for these things to happen, and the work of the Holy Spirit, before he can execute the will, before he can bring to us the everything that's been left by us, for us, by Jesus, when he died, first of all, he's got to stop us drawing on our account. And as long as we're drawing on the account of our strength, we won't draw on the account of the strength of Jesus. So therefore, in regards to faith, the truth of the matter is, the Holy Spirit is working so that we lose our faith, you see. And when you've prayed for the 400th person who hasn't got healed, you begin to get the message, all right? But the important <coughs> thing is this. It doesn't mean we give up. It doesn't mean we say, oh, well, this is a waste of time. It's obviously my faith, therefore it's a waste of time. No, Jesus has said, lay hands on the sick. Let's keep doing it. But let's keep doing it in the assurance that in the very obedience to God's word, in the very failure, in the very constant failure, but still we obey the Lord, that our faith will start to empty, we'll lose it, and we'll begin to come into the faith of Jesus.